All right, Glenn asked me to talk about uh, how we utilize uh, um, poultry litter. Uh, like Glenn said, we're from Northwest Ohio. Um, we were really fortunate back in 2014 to have a uh, layer facility come into our area, and that's who we get uh, all of our uh, litter product from. They right now they got about three million birds, so they produce quite a bit. Um, the big thing we're looking at is advantages of the litter. Uh, just a couple things highlighted here. Adds organic matter to soil, which naturally increases your water holding capacity. Uh, nutrients are available. Um, PEK is 100% soluble. Um, and it's got a good source of calcium and sulfur to it. So the first thing we got to do, some of these slides you're going to see, because Sam Mullins, I kind of robbed some of his slides from a presentation I got from him too. But um, you got to see what the nutrients are in it. Every facility is required to have a sample, one sample a year out of each building that they store the manure in. Um, biggest thing that we see is um, we get your total nitrogen, we get your organic in, um, ammonium nitrogen, and um, and then. A&L is good enough to put out the uh, um, estimated uh, value at the end of the, for one growing season. This particular sample is telling us basically we got about 48 pounds of nitrogen that we can take advantage of in that growing season. Um, phosphorus, this particular sample is saying we got basically 48 pounds of sulfur available this growing season. Uh, potash, this particular sample says we got 31. Um, sulfur, we got five point, well, basically six pounds, but three pounds is going to be available this year. This is just one sample. We, we pull a sample out of every pile we put in the field. And since 2014, when we started, to the last sample we pulled last year, it's just kind of ironic. I got them all in sequence. The last sample is our two. 2020th sample, so we've got a real good average of what's coming out of them barns. There's three barns we pull out of. Normally, when we're making our recommendations, we figure, and we're just using the average, um, we figure 40 or figure 50 pounds of phosphorus, 40 um, pounds of uh, K, um, that three pounds, four pounds of sulfur is pretty consistent. 45 pounds of nitrogen is pretty consistent too. And then it also, um, this particular sample has 97 pounds of calcium. We normally figure around 130 pounds is an average of all of our samples that we ran, um, which makes a beautiful liming agent. Um, one thing we found is every place we've been using litter and, and got it in a rotation, uh, you'll, you'll never lime again. Seems like we get up to around a seven pH and it just kind of stays there. So now that we, you know, we know what's in the sample, we know what values that we can use to make our recommendations. The next thing we got to do is soil test. And as CLMs, we're required to have a soil test that's three years or less on file. Um, our book work for uh, litter is, is a lot. And uh, every farmer that we deal with that's got litter and they got their own book, we got to have field maps, we have to have the current soil test in there, and then we actually put our as applied maps in there, and then you have to have maps showing all your buffers and everything. So, uh, first thing we do is get the soil test. We get that back just for a real quick glance. First thing I look at is the, the uh, phosphorus in there. And uh, that determines basically how many uh, or whether I can or can't spread uh, litter on that field. That's just like a quick glance. Uh, the state of Ohio has been real generous to us and they've told us what levels everything has to be. Sam Mullins had this exact same picture up here. I actually stole this out of presentation he did a couple years ago. Um, the top one, we can basically put uh, litter on for two or three growing crops, whatever, and um, actually put a buildup on it. The medium one is we can actually put 
um, litter on for a couple years growing crop. The high one, we basically can only put litter on for one growing crop. And the very high, we can't do nothing on that soil. And this also takes into consideration um, the nitrogen too. You gotta actually use the nitrogen and the phosphorus when you're determining what that rate, rate is. Then Ohio State wants us to use the tri-state recommendations. And we're, you know, we're right in the process of changing the tri-state recommendations, so we're still using the old. Um, the major crops that we're running basically on is corn, beans, and wheat. We use litter on a lot of acres of wheat as a starter fertilizer. Um, and then we got some organic guys we deal with that are using the uh, litter for their nitrogen source for their uh, corn. Um, I've had some guys um, that are getting some pretty good luck with some litter even on soybeans. We probably average about a ton and three quarter on all the acres across the board, but usually if we're putting it in front of beans, we're only putting a ton on. We got a lot of beans, back to beans, back to beans in certain areas up there where they got the heavy clay. Um, so usually we want to put a ton every couple of years in there. We're running um, beans, wheat, and corn. We're usually putting uh, litter in front of the wheat anywhere from a ton and a half to two tons. Then we put litter on after the wheat comes off, followed with the cover crop, and then they'll go uh, corn and beans or beans and corn in, in that rotation. We also um, do VRT on manure. It uh, works pretty well. Um, we've got some farms that's got hot spots in it where, you know, that red in there is actually applying zero. Um, I, that's going to continue to get more because the more we litter we use and we start bringing the phosphate levels up, we're going to have more and more of those hot spots. We did something that was really interesting, though. Um, we have a farm along the river well, it's up ground, and it's got a real ridge that goes through there, and we've tried with regular fertilizers and, and gypsum and, and lime, and we just had a ridge going through there. We just, I think the um, organic matter on was at like a half percent. And we actually uh, VRT'd chicken litter on the whole field, and then we came in and, and put cattle manure on that ridge. And we've been working with that farmer for years. And when we did that, the next year you could actually see, you used to be able to really see that ridge in whatever crop was in there. We actually, it, it, we could still tell it was there, but if you didn't know it was there, it wasn't there as noticeable. So we actually used two different forms of uh, manure to correct that issue. And it worked really good. I gotta pat myself on the back on that one. Uh, then the state's really nice and they, we got all kinds of rules we get to follow. Um, this is just a real, like a real quick cheat sheet you use. It tells you what, what your setbacks and everything has got to be and uh, how close to house you can put it and, and that sort of thing. Once you know what you're going to put on and everything, then we go to the field. Um, I can't remember the length of that building, but they're huge. Um, all of our stuff gets trucked out. Um, we got trucks with dumps and we got trucks with belts. Uh, these are great compaction tools right here. Um, the truckers and all, every guy that trucks for us, we got five of our own and then we got other trucks come in. They got a strict rule. They're not allowed to pull into the field. They always got to back in and they got to back in the same track every time. And that way we only got one spot. And we, like if we're going to spread right away, we only got to be about 100 feet off the road. But if we stockpile, we got to be 300 feet off the road. And so it's kind of critical you, you do that one. The truckers would much rather pull in, dump, make a big circle and come back out. We did that the first year. Um, what well, it was a mess. We learned a lot first year. We made a lot of mistakes. So there's a good compaction tool. 
we sort of got around. A lot of guys that are that are using it and are in a rotation, we actually stockpile or stack in the field, same spot every time. So we you got that same lane, but it's there every time. And then if you if you stockpile a pile out there for a long period of time, nothing's going to grow where that pile was at. And uh, so if you use that same circle, which is a real small area of the field, you only got that one circle instead of having four or five scattered through the field. So a little common sense um, really helps out a lot. Uh, we go out the field, we put in a pile. When you make a stockpile, you push everything up into one pile so it's more like a cone. That way no water or anything can lay on it. It'll make an inch crust and the water or rain will just run right off. After a week, you can't even smell it. You can walk right up next to it. And, well, I can't smell it. Somebody that's been around it probably can. But <laughs> um, it generates too much heat in the center of the pile that uh, fly larvae can't survive, so there's no flies. Um, if we just dump 100 feet off the road and we're spreading right away within 24 hours, they just line the piles up in a straight row. We come in, we load them in the machine, and we spread. Now, now I, I said compaction, that um, semi is a real good compaction tool. These spreaders and tractors uh, can be real good. And the loader is an awesome compaction tool, too. If you look back, we actually put flotation tires on all, all our loaders that are in the field. We've got flotation tires on. Those are 66. Um, the first year, we didn't have them. And uh, where them piles was, it was just hard and bright. We went to these, the farmers really like these. We still compact, you don't get me wrong, but nothing like we did. Um, the place we buy the table, all of our spreaders are tebby spreaders, they're made in Germany, they're, they're fabulous spreaders. I can spread litter just as uniform as you can spread fertilizer. Grinds it up, so we spread 50 foot. That's why we can put it in front of wheat and we have no blems in the wheat whatsoever. But I wanted to put tracks on them and the company I bought the spreaders off said, you know, we can't get them work. We don't offer that. Don't do it. I'm pretty bullheaded, and I figured I could. And uh, so I spent on two machines, uh, basically forty thousand dollars on each. Uh, the manufacturer was right; they don't work. Um, <laughs> nothing but trouble. Uh, very expensive mistake. Our learning. Um, I was just half my daughter's college tuition, anyways. So then we went uh, to these low sidewall tires. I don't know how many of you guys are using these. These are phenomenal. Um, those are uh, 1250s on the tractor and 1100s on the spreader. Um, uh, it's, it's unbelievable the difference. We did have one of our tractors was a uh, quad track. Uh, we left that go back. And believe it or not, a lot of the farmers that we were dealing with was glad to see us get rid of that tractor. It was heavy, it was, it was a 540. But uh, these so low sidewalls, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I just, what I read and I talked to the tire company. And uh, so we got out here. And the first field we did was in Paulding County. It was on, line, uh, on Laddie Clay, so it was in the fall. It wasn't wet by any means, but it wasn't dry. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with Laddie Clay, it, it, it packs real easy. Um, on the left is right in the center of the track. We had 16 ton on that spreader at that time. Um, we hit resistance at eight inches, and it's the old plow layer in that farm. That was in the track with the 16 ton. The one on the left is out in the middle of the field, not in the track. We hit the same layer at eight inches, and it was same on the gauge when we broke two. So I was, I was happy. Um, but if you go out when it's really wet, I don't care what you use, you're going to pack it. But uh, packing to us with the, the size of the equipment we got is huge. I've spent a lot of money in, since, in, since we got in this, just trying to eliminate that the most I can. Something that we've, uh, um, some history we've got. We've got some guys that's been with us since we started in 14. We're just now on our second round of soil test for them. This particular farm here, this guy here, he farms, uh, he's wheat, uh, corn, followed by beans, and then wheat. And we put litter on, he, this guy we put litter on two ton in front of his wheat. 
then two ton after is wheat, and then um, nothing for the bean crop following that. The bottom sample here was uh, the first one we put pulled in 2014, and the top one was the sample we pulled in 17, the third after three years. We didn't see a um, saw a little bit of increase in the uh, in the uh, phosphorus, but not a lot when you figure in uh, that three-year period we put four ton of litter on. But basically, if you figure out the uh, um, removal, basically we just fertilized removal, and that was it. They're, they're raising 100 bushel wheat and um, 180, 200 bushel corn, and uh, I don't know what the beans are, 50, 60 bushel. But uh, um, when it comes to the um, soil pH, um, you can see, let's see if I can get this pointed over here. You can see here in uh, 14, their pH levels and what the beet buffer here is. Here's what it was after two applications of litter. Uh, we got our pHs almost all up in uh, six and our buffer pHs are a lot better than what they was actually we just got a few zones in this field that we'd have to come in with some lime. But that's just after two treatments of litter, we changed it that much. And it seems like from what we're seeing is we get that um, pH around seven, it just seems like it flattens off. So pretty happy with that. And that's pretty consistent with everything we've been seeing on the test that we got repetition to. The other thing is, um, your percent calcium, if you look here before we started, and then look up here after two, uh, two out of three years, or basically a four ton of litter, what we brought them up to. Um, everybody's kind of, depending on what consultants you talk to, whether that calcium percentage means more. It means more to some consultants than to others. Um, I do know that where we're doing this and that bring that calcium level up, the guys really like the way it plants. The, the ground just seems not to crust near as bad. Uh, whether that equates to yield, I, I, I couldn't tell you honestly, but it's consistently, it, 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 it goes up. Haven't seen a lot on the uh, potash. Not a lot of change there. Um, actually, it's going up a little bit. But uh, this farm has not had a, a drop of this farm, since we started in 14, has not had any regular fertilizer on it except for anhydrous in 28, um, and that's it. No, uh, and they used to be um, basically DAP and uh, AMS and uh, potash. These guys are extremely happy on what it's doing. We've cut about, uh, on these guys here, we cut their fertilizer costs about 45% from what they were spending. So that even makes them more happy. Um, another thing we, we've been seeing is uh, we're trying to bring the organic matter up. And uh, on this one here, these guys till everything. So you don't really see much change in organic matter. Um, I've got a gentleman over in Indiana that's got some uh, real uh, mixture of soil. The, the top of their hills are that gravelly sand down to some heavy ground in the bottom. They've been no-tilling and uh, using uh, cover crops since 2014 when we started working with them. So I went back and looked at their soil tests, and, the, and they use a consultant to do their tests, so we get a new test every two years with them. So I even got more history with that one. And uh, it is interesting. This here, I couldn't find anything that was consistent where I could see a, a change in the uh, um, organic matter. Again, this, these guys still plow. And they, they work ground and all. But with that guy was no time. These, these guys are used in sort of all different kinds of, of uh, cover crop mixes. Um, I mean, they, they've experimented with them all, I think. But I could actually see anywhere from um, about a half percent to three quarter percent 
pretty consistent on every one of them fields I did, which I thought was astronomical. Because when I got out of college, they told us, you know, you'll never be able to raise organic matter in your entire lifetime. It's just be totally impossible. Um, so we are seeing if we are seeing where we're using a cover crop with the uh, um, litter. We are actually bringing the organic matter up a little bit. We can actually see a little bit. Um, one thing we noticed that's a good selling tool with the litter too is uh, um, where the guys are putting the cover crop on their wheat stubble and we put litter on, they get a phenomenal growth out of their uh, cover crop. And it's just like anything, you get more growth on top, you're getting a lot of growth underneath. And that ground, the, the growth underneath is probably more important than the growth on top as far as what building your organic matter and everything. And it, it, it's a pretty good selling tool because the neighbor drives by and he looks at that guy's cover crop and he looks at his cover crop where he's just using regular fertilizer if he fertilized it. And uh, it's just night and day difference between the two. A lot of these cover crop programs that the, the state's trying to get us to do, which I think are good, but most people just sow it to try to get the cash and um, they don't care whether it grows or not. And if, if you really want to take advantage of it and help help the soil and make the soil healthier and clean up Lake Erie, you want to get as much good of that cover crop as you possibly can. Last year we was really wet. We didn't get hardly anything planted. We used uh, manure in front of a couple of oats fields. You guys took the harvest to bale. That's the only thing we put on them, and uh, anywhere from two to three ton on that. We tried two different times, and we had some jerry oats, and, and uh, just using that litter. And we had rain every three or four days all, all year, but we was uh, we got like six and a half bale, round bales an acre, all that, just um, using litter. So it's got a lot of advantages. We're just It's kind of exciting. We've been in long enough that we can actually see and correlate stuff to it. And now we're looking at what we, what we can do to even make it better. I mean, we spent a lot of time on the um, compaction side of it, spent a lot of money trying to fix that because it don't matter what you do to the soil, if you go in there and compact it, you, you haven't helped anything. So we're trying to fine tune now and find some other ways to tweak it. Uh, we're gonna get a drone this year, we're gonna do some field imagery and stuff and see see what the next step is to it, but the, the litter's been really good to us. I'm not saying th this particular guy here, we haven't used any fertilizer on. In the farms we farm, we haven't used any fertilizer on besides the litter either. The gentleman I was telling you about in Indiana using cover crops, um, he's using a little bit of potash on them uh, really light ridges. So um, that's still, we're still tweaking that. So I uh, kind of rushed through that. It goes fast when you're up here. Um, <laughs> if anybody has any questions, you know, I'll try to answer them best I can. Yeah, we do. We do thousands of acres before the wheat. What's that? We figure what we're putting on in front of wheat, we're figuring we're getting... Uh, when we do the, the nitrogen recommendation for the spring for the top, we figure about 40 pounds of nitrogen that we subtract. We, we usually try to fertilize wheat for 100 bushel wheat, and so we're trying to put on 130, 140 pounds of total nitrogen. Well, if we put litter in front of it, we're only putting about 30 gallon or 90 pound of 28 in the spring. And that nitrogen is there. One thing about chicken litter, most of that nitrogen is organic. And one thing, you'll, it scared the heck out of us the first year is uh, we had a side-by-side -side in there where we did the old program using fertilizer versus using the litter. And the farmer we did it with, he split applied his nitrogen. And, but where we did litter, we only put one application on. Well, he put the first application on him first, uh, or the end of March when it's still cold. That wheat green dried up. Our wheat didn't. So I'm thinking, oh, well, we lost all the end. This is the worst thing in the world. It's, this is going to flop. Well, then it warmed up. The organic end kicked in. And when we went to put the second application on, his, where the regular fertilizer was, and we was putting the first application on ours, you couldn't tell where the strips were. The organic and had caught, and the wheat took off, 
and they went to yield, and we actually, and I can't say this is because of the manure, but the, the strips with the litter actually yielded better than the, the regular fertilizer. Mike. Yeah. I think his question also was, do you count on the poultry litter as starter fertilizer in the fall for that wheat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's our whole wheat program as far as fertilizer. It's a starter, starter package. We wanted to try using litter in the spring as a nitrogen source too, but in our soil types, in the weight of our equipment, it's it just not feasible. We can't get on the field at the right time, so it just hasn't worked out. But where they put it in front of it, they were like, go ahead. I was wondering what you found the best way to handle earth complaints were. Just say, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, you, you use a little common sense, though. Uh, if, if you're going to spread on a weekend, uh, try to find the fields away from town. Um, you got your prevailing winds, try, try to spread on, if you got to spread next town, spread on the other side, the downwind side of the, the uh, um, town. Housing development's the same way, but we get complaints. Uh, they call the state, and uh, almost every complaint we got except for a handful is, is smell. It's either smell or stockpiles. They don't think they're in the right spot. Um, that's been about it. But use some common sense. You can eliminate a lot of problems. Yeah. Do you spray on the rate on that also? Yes. Does, yep. Does the gate move on your spreader or how do you? The web. Them, them spreaders. I don't know if I can. Oops. Them spreaders a whole floor of walks. There's actually two chains in the bottom. The manure goes to the back of the spreader and the compartment's completely closed. There's two beaters and it grinds it up, drops it on the spinners, and we spread 50 foot. But uh, yeah, the whole floor moves. And then uh, the variable rate, it just uh, slows the web up or speeds it up. All these spreaders got scales on them because the density will change based on the moisture of the litter. So the guy in the cab, he, he, you know, the monitor, you got 10, the density is 40 pounds or whatever. Well, you get in a wet batch and it goes up. That, that mon the scale actually tells the weight you put on and the average every 15 seconds. It'll tell you what your, it'll flash the ton per acre you're doing and it can match it up. Usually the guy driving the tractor um, might have to change his density, which you can do on a, on a run. All of our spreaders all drive themselves. But the guys got to pay attention just for little stuff like that. Um, when, when I bought the first one, he goes, do you want the scale? And he said what the, the option cost. I said, I don't need a scale. And he said what the option cost of it would be. And compared to the whole spreader, I said, oh, that ain't much give it to me. Well, I'm glad I did because that's how we found out that change. Well, we was on our second field, and the guy running called me. He says, he goes, I'm, I'm uh, running way short. And... He got the center of a pile and it was really wet and uh, we've seen it on the monitor it was so we just changed the density and went from there they're, they're very accurate though once you get them dialed in yeah so when you variable rate the manure do you have the guys variable rate the sizes in next spring do what now if you variable rate manure will the guys variable rate the nitrogen next spring there's some guys looking at doing that right now i don't know any of the guys who are doing this doing it but that question he asked is if they're variable rate in the, the NP and K in the fall, are these guys the variable rating, variable rating the nitrogen in the spring? We've got some customers, that, well, we got one right there that's doing it. I didn't realize he was doing that. So, yeah, yes, we do. We got one right there.